So uh, for folks who are just trickling in, this is the Law of Reversing Jailbreaking Talk. Um, I'm Fred Von Lohman from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm a senior staff attorney there focusing on intellectual property, copyright, that kind of thing. Uh, with me is Jennifer Granick, no stranger to many DEF CON veterans, who is our Civil Liberties Director. So without further ado, we're going to be talking about uh, sort of four basic uh, sets of things here. Uh, first, I want to sort of go over the kinds of law problems that reverse engineers should be worried about. I'm not sure we'll give everybody all the answers they hope to have, but at least hopefully you'll know what questions you should be asking before you get in trouble. We'll use two examples of reverse engineering uh, to sort of sprinkle real-world examples in this talk. One will be jailbreaking the iPhone, something that is on a lot of people's minds. Uh, including our good friends at Apple, who recently, if you missed it, seem to think we are going to crash the entire nation's cell network with jailbroken iPhones. <clears throat> I, I expect that will be a talk at next year's DEF CON. I encourage all of you to attend that. Uh, and online gaming is another example. And then we'll give a few concrete strategy and uh, tips like that. So um, EFF probably doesn't need a big introduction. These are some of the thi other things we do. We're doing a talk at 4 o'clock that's a general Ask EFF talk. So if folks want to come and query us about any of the other things on our agenda, please come to that. So the takeaway I want you guys to get here, if there is one thing I want you to walk away with, I want you to remember four basic problems to be aware of when it comes to reverse engineering, four legal concerns. One is license agreements. So we've all clicked I agree. Uh, many times we probably shouldn't have clicked I agree, but there are all of those there, and increasingly courts think that 20,000 words of legalese actually matters. Uh, the second thing to worry about is copyright law. Whenever you are making copies of software, including potentially even just copies in RAM, copyright law probably is something to think about. Uh, third thing, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, those four letters get a lot of play. Uh, the thing you have to remember is if you are circumventing a technical protection measure, often people say, oh, that's DRM. It can be DRM. It can also be other things. Anytime you're bypassing or circumventing anything, even if it's just obfuscation, certainly if it's encryption, you should be thinking about the DMCA. And then finally, if you are accessing a computer that is not yours, uh, if it's a server out there, uh, that's, you should be thinking about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and that will be something Jennifer will talk more about. So we're not talking today about patents or trade secrets. Frankly, these are not as much of a threat for most reverse engineers as the other four items we will be talking about. So talking about jailbreaking first, let's start with the license question. As I said, license agreements are out there. The jailbreaking context brings us really two. Um, I should probably list them in the reverse order. The first is the end user agreements you agree to as an iPhone owner slash customer. Uh, I, last time I checked, uh, you have to agree to over 21,000 words in order to activate an iPhone. Uh, I haven't counted the latest Apple Rev. It might be a few hundred more or less now. They just changed the license agreement about two months ago, uh, actually in direct response to our effort to get jailbreaking legalized in the Copyright Office. They went to the trouble of changing the license agreement to try to make it extra clear that you don't own any of the software on the iPhone, even though you own the hardware. Uh, I still think they didn't win on that, but we'll get there later. The other one is the SDK uh, and API licenses that folks agree to if you are a developer for the iPhone. Uh, so these are both licenses. If you're reverse engineering, you're going to want to know what they say. You're particularly going to want to read to make sure uh, that, to figure out what, if anything, they say about reverse engineering. They specifically attempt to forbid reverse engineering, and they go into some detail to say, including decompilation, including you know, a whole bunch of other things they say they don't want you to do. So there are other, it, it's not a simple matter of, oh, it's there, I'm not allowed to do it. There are a lot of questions about license agreements, about their enforceability, but I'm here really to urge you not to ignore them. Um, realize they're there, take the trouble to read them if you're thinking about agreeing to them. Are they enforceable? Often courts in the United States have been saying that if you click I agree, that 
licenses are generally enforceable. That doesn't mean that every clause and every provision will necessarily be enforced, but just so folks know, there is a mythology out there that, oh, this stuff can't possibly be legally binding. Courts actually have been saying they often are. Big question there is, do you have to click I agree? Browser apps tend to be frowned on by courts, so those are the things where we just give you a link, we never show you the terms, we just say, oh, you used it, therefore you're bound. Courts tend not to be very friendly to those. On the other hand, if you clicked I agree, particularly if you clicked I agree before you actually paid any money, courts tend to be friendlier there. Um, The other thing to keep in mind about licenses is what's your maximum downside risk? If you breach a license, it's like any other breach of contract that you would have in any contract that you'd enter into with someone else. And normally in the law, that means they get what we call actual damages, which means in the case of jailbreaking, Apple would have to say, you've actually caused some financial harm to Apple by jailbreaking your iPhone. I personally doubt they would be able to show any real harm given the several hundred dollars you've probably paid them and you may also be paying AT&T. It's hard to see how jailbreaking your own iPhone harms them, but it's good to keep in mind that's the kind of remedy we're talking about. We're not talking about going to prison. We're not talking about huge statutory damages. We're not talking about the kinds of things that I'll get to in a minute that come up with copyright and the DMCA. Um, so reverse engineering, uh, excuse me, reverse engineering prohibitions have been enforced by a couple of courts in the United States. The final word is far from out on this. EFF continues to look for reverse engineering cases to bring to try to shape this law in a way that leaves room for reverse engineering. The other thing to keep in mind is that in Europe, European law is extremely friendly to reverse engineering compared to US law. In fact, in Europe, License agreements are not allowed to ban reverse engineering. And if you read license agreements carefully, you'll see they're often carefully written to say, you may not reverse engineer except to the extent the law in your jurisdiction allows reverse engineering. And that magic language is usually in there for people who want to sell in both the United States and Europe. They want to leave the door open uh, under the European law. So things to keep in mind. Um, So let's talk a little bit about copyright, the second of the four things uh, I mentioned to keep in mind for reverse engineering. Copyright is scarier than contract, scarier than licenses. For the reasons I alluded to a moment ago, there are statutory damages. Many of you may have heard about the uh, uh, Jamie Thomas Rasset in in Minnesota who just uh, got a $2 million judgment against her for sharing 26 songs on a peer-to-peer file sharing network. That's the result of these so-called statutory damages. That means the copyright owner doesn't have to prove that you actually harmed them the way they would for a contract claim. They can simply say, hey, you infringed my copyright. I'm automatically entitled to a minimum of $750, up to a maximum of $30,000, or up to $150,000 if you're willful for per work infringed. So if we're talking about the iPhone software, how many pieces of software are you copying potentially there? I would argue if it's the firmware, that's just one piece of software, one statutory damage award. I'm not sure Apple would agree. Um, Nobody has yet been sued in that. Um, There are injunctions. They can say you're not allowed to do this anymore. And there are potentially criminal penalties. Um, Criminal penalties in copyright tend to be reserved for piracy and counterfeiting. I'm not aware of anyone who's ever been brought up on criminal charges for reverse engineering in the context of interoperability or any other sort of pro-competitive, pro-research kind of reverse engineering. But it is possible if there's a commercial motive that, you know, you never can be sure that some district attorney might not be talked into something. But at least so far, the situation has been pretty positive. We have not seen criminal charges in copyright for traditional reverse engineering. So the two main defenses in copyright for reverse engineers are fair use, section 107 of the Copyright Act, and section 117 of the Copyright Act, which basically gives the owner of software certain rights to make copies and adaptations. So quickly, fair use. We have a couple of very good cases in the fair use uh, jurisprudence that say, hey, if you have to make copies in order to access function and idea, the stuff that's not protected by copyright, 
in order to make an interoperable product, that's been viewed as a fair use. There are two cases, both involving video game consoles, um, Sega and uh, the PlayStation. And in those cases, the court said, hey, if you need to reverse engineer to figure out how to make game cartridges that work in the console, you're making your own game, you're not stealing code out of the console, you just want to know how to make your game work on the console, that's a fair use. The key, two key uh, pieces of this in those cases the courts were very interested in whether you got legitimate access to the software that you were reverse engineering. So you want to have done, uh, you want not to have taken the cracked version from BitTorrent. Um, and also, the courts don't like it if you're copying code unnecessarily. Fair use is something that's not there to save you the effort of coding your own thing if you could have done it. It's there to allow you access to the pieces you absolutely needed. So try to avoid lifting code from the, uh, the code that you're reverse engineering. Try not to wholesale copy chunks into your own uh, resulting code. Section 117, this is a less well-known part of the Copyright Act. It says that the owner of a copy of a computer program may copy or adapt the program as an essential step of the utilization of the computer program with a machine. So this is basically the idea that if I buy a piece of software, I should be able to run that piece of software on a computer without being worried about violating copyright by simply using the software for the purpose that it was intended. That also includes this adapt language. The courts, are, there's not much case law about how far that adapt right reaches, but it certainly could reach certain kinds of reverse engineering. I would argue that adapting the firmware on your iPhone in order to run, to run applications of your choice should fall within this. In fact, we are arguing that in front of the Copyright Office right now, seeking an exemption to the DMCA for jailbreaking. So, as I mentioned, one question is what, how far does ADAPT reach? Another question is do you own the software? These are issues that people fight about. The courts still haven't given us clear answers. In my view, you own the firmware on your iPhone. In Apple's view, you are merely licensed. Um, this is a fight that uh, several cases are working on right now. But suffice to say, you want to think about whether or not it's the kind of software you own. In other words, you bought it, one-time fee, keep it forever, can't be taken away from you, versus whether it's the kind of software that you are merely leasing or otherwise given very limited access to. For that kind of code, reverse engineering, 117 might not help you. So moving to the third category of legal uh, areas to think about when reverse engineering, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, many folks here are already familiar with that. Section 1201 of the Copyright Act says you may not circumvent technical protection measures and you may not traffic in tools that are circumvention tools. So here's the actual language, you know, uh, this not actually the actual language, but this is the basic gist of the code, of the, of the law. It says no person shall circumvent, no trafficking in tools, raises a lot of questions then about, well, what is a technological measure? What are the things you're not allowed to circumvent or bypass? Well, there are a few things we know from the law, and there's a lot of other areas that are still gray. Courts have said DVD encryption is a technical protection measure. Therefore, DVD ripping, in the eyes of most courts, would be viewed as a violation of the DMCA, decrypting encrypted content without using the authorized key. Um, protocol encryption, probably a technical protection measure, uh, came up in the context of real media streams uh, in a case back in 2001. Um, authentication handshakes, also probably a technical protection measure that should trigger your thinking about this. Chain of trust code signing, that's what Apple uses in the uh, iPhone. I think a strong chance that a court would find that to be covered by the DMCA. Harder questions are what about simple code obfuscation? What about undocumented protocols? We've seen software vendors argue that that stuff is protected by the DMCA as well. I tend to disagree. The courts have not given us clear guidance for that. But whenever you see this kind of measure put in the code to stop you from reverse engineering, you'll want to think about the DMCA, maybe call a lawyer to talk about it. There are fortunately a bunch of exceptions that are built into the law to allow certain activities. Reverse engineering for interoperability is probably the most important one for our purposes. There's also one for security testing, encryption research, one for law enforcement, of course. 
And some courts have said there also has to be a real possibility of copyright infringement. That if your circumvention can't actually infringe any copyright, say, for example, because it's firmware in a garage door opener, as was the case in one uh, recent uh, ruling, uh, really no chance of infringing the firmware in the garage door opener if the code never comes out of the, the actual garage door opener. Court said no DMCA violation because no chance of copyright infringement. So reverse engineering, this is the exception, kind of long, worth reading carefully, breaks down to a few key elements. You have to have lawfully obtained the code. You have to do the reverse engineering for the sole purpose of identifying and analyzing to achieve interoperability. So again, the focus in this exception is interoperability, making your own piece of software to work in conjunction with the piece that you're reverse engineering. The statute talks about program-to-program -program interoperability, a lot of debate about whether this extends to program-to-data interoperability, uh, a distinction that I'm the first one to admit kind of doesn't make much sense, but the courts seem to think, well, if you're reverse engineering to get your DVD to play back on a Linux machine, that's different than if you're reverse engineering to make one piece of software work with another piece of software. Um, finally, it, or two last things. One, the information has to have been not previously readily available. Uh, and finally, you have to still prove that you didn't infringe copyright, so it takes us back to our fair use discussion. Um, so very quickly here, talk a bit about how this applies uh, to the jailbreaking scenario. There are really three categories of people to worry about. They have different questions that they have to ask. There's the independent app developers. I think app developers have relatively little to worry about under the DMCA. They are not themselves having, generally, to reverse engineer the firmware. Um, if you're just putting your app in the Cydia store, develop the app, put it in the store, not much risk there. The jailbreaking uh, tool developers, the, uh, of which at least one is in the audience I know, God bless you. Uh, Ponage tool is wonderful. I'm not prepared to admit in public whether I, in fact, have used it just last weekend. <clears throat> so uh, there, I think, obviously, the DMCA is a question, should be considered. But frankly, I think the reverse engineering for interoperability exception could very well apply to developing Ponage tool. It is, after all, creating interoperability program to program. Uh, and finally, what about iPhone owners? Well, when someone actually jailbreaks their own iPhone, I think it's rather hard to argue that they are analyzing for the purpose of developing interoperable software. Most people who are jailbreaking their iPhone are not themselves developing their own code. They're just jailbreaking their iPhone to use some, you know, Sycorder, Tethering, GV Mobile this uh, last week. Um, so for them, we have gone to the Copyright Office uh, in, uh, starting in December and are arguing there now to get a specific DMCA exception for iPhone owners to jailbreak their phone. We've been arguing with Apple about this now for about six months. We'll have a ruling in October, and hopefully that will yield uh, some legal certainty for owners. I will say Apple hasn't sued or threatened to sue any individual iPhone owner for jailbreaking their phone, as far as I'm aware, but they have taken a very strong public position in front of the Copyright Office that they believe it violates the DMCA. Of course, as long as they say that, it's going to be hard for independent app developers to develop the kind of legitimate marketplace that they deserve. So with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague Jennifer Granick to talk about the fourth and final category, what happens when you connect to a server that's not your own. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. OK, so um, we talked a bit about the jailbreaking of the iPhone, but, but sometimes when you do reverse engineering, you're looking to do something else. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, special issue of online gaming and uh, doing reverse engineering of online gaming, just to illustrate that there are other areas of the law that, that may apply. Now, when reverse engineering an online game, like let's say something like World of Warcraft, you have many of the same issues legally that you have with jailbreaking, but now you have the special issue that there is a network involved. And um, this is different because now you have to deal with the areas of law that protect networks. So that is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. 
and um, is the federal law. And the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is the federal computer crime law. Um, it is codified at 18 U.S.C. 1030. That's the uh, statute for it. And this federal law is um, kind of prototypical of the computer crime laws that are out there. Every state has its own computer crime law as well. So um, I, what I'm talking about here will have um, some implication for many of the state laws which are kind of built off of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but each state law is really different. Um, and I'm going to talk later on today at 1 o'clock about some cases that arose under the CFAA and the Massachusetts Computer Crime Law. And so people who are interested in, com in uh, how computer crime is regulated and what it has to do with um, legitimate uh, hacking and computer security work can come to that talk as well, and I'll do a little bit of a comparison between the federal law and the Massachusetts law, which is very interesting. I'll just tell you, for those of you who uh, are here in Nevada right now, I also looked up the Nevada computer crime law before I came here to DEF CON, and it is extremely broad. Um, it prohibits altering or tampering with or gaining access to documents that are outside of a computer network. So if you see any papers lying around near a computer, I wouldn't actually touch those without consulting a lawyer first. So this is what the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act says. And um, there's basically an uh, essential concept in here, two essential concepts that are the trigger for the illegal activity. One is the concept of access, and the other is the concept of, of uh, exceeding authorization or doing so without authorization. So these are supposed to be the things that distinguish between legal activity and illegal activity. So what does it mean to access a computer? Well, the case law has basically interpreted that term to mean anything you do to a computer, any kind of interaction with it whatsoever. Computer, you send a packet, you've accessed it, okay? You look at something, um, you know, you access a web server, you look at whatever data it sends back to you, you've accessed it. So they've interpreted access extremely broadly. There's never been a case that said this isn't a computer crime because there wasn't really access here. Okay, so now the second thing is about without authorization. Well, what is authorization or something without authorization? And it turns out that without authorization is also has been interpreted extremely broadly. So, um, you know, do you need express or written permission? I mean, we use computers all the time without getting any kind of permission. Um, and what the courts have kind of tended to do is um, have two sort of fuzzy tests about whether you do something without authorization or you exceed your authorization. And one of the fuzzy tests is like, you know you shouldn't have done that and it was um, something that was not appropriate and so you exceeded your authorization. So there's a number of cases that involve disgruntled ex-employees who go from one company to another company and take their data with them, take contacts or other stuff like that with them. And in a number of those cases, not all, because there's started to be a pushback in the federal courts against this idea, but in a number of those cases, um, the courts have said, you know, the minute you stop working for your employer and started thinking I'm going over to the competition you no longer that's no longer you're no longer acting in your employer's interest and so you no longer have authorization so think about that you're using a computer in a way that's not in the computer owner's best interest and somehow that means that you're denied authorization um, another kind of trend in the case law is this uh, idea that um, you don't have authorization if you access in a way that is contrary to the terms of service so the big case in this area was um, the prosecution last year of Lori Drew for violating the MySpace Terms of Service for providing false information about her identity. Now, those of you who follow this case may know that this was in the context of, um, of the, uh, what, the other name for the Lori Drew case that people refer to it as sort of a shorthand as the Megan Meyer case. And this was a situation where this Missouri housewife um, made a false account on MySpace in the name and identity of like a teenage boy, and uh, people used that account to have interaction with this teenage girl who was her neighbor, and um, the boy said hurtful and nasty things to the girl, and the girl killed herself, which was this big tragedy that then resulted in a, a United States attorney in Los Angeles prosecuting this Missouri housewife under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and basically what they said is you violated the MySpace Terms of Service, so you didn't have authorization. Okay? Now, just to remind you, these are those same terms of service that, as Fred told you earlier, are considered browse wrap that you don't click through on a, I agree, and you can't even get contract damages for violating, but now it's become arguably the basis for uh, federal crime. Um, 
the case, in this case, the woman was convicted, and then the judge just recently overturned her conviction on the grounds that that interpretation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that resulted in her being convicted was vague. And we are waiting for a written opinion from the court on that topic to discuss the issue and then be something that you know, we can point to to show that the idea that violating terms of service is somehow now a federal crime is ridiculous. Okay. The next part of 1030 that's really important is this uh, 1030A5, which is the causes damage provision. I'm going to talk a lot about this at um, 1 o'clock, but you can hear it's a little bit different from the access without authorization. This involves transmitting programs or information or code, and as a result, causing damage without authorization to a protected computer, which basically just means any computer in interstate commerce. Okay. Um, and this is the rest of A5 if you access without authorization and cause damage. And damage is, into, is, into, is defined as just any impairment to the integrity or availability of the data. I'm not, integrity is a term that's also been very loosely, um, very loosely interpreted. So what's the situation here? Well, and why is it so special with online games? Well, with online games, um, you have this situation where very often there's client software that resides on your own computer. And then the client software interacts with software on the central server for the game. And your client communicates with the server, and data and packets are transmitted between those two things. And you want to know how the game works. So you do some reverse engineering. You either listen to the traffic between or something like that, or you manipulate the data that resides on your own computer. And one of the things that we're going to say to you a little later at the end here is, you know, if you do your testing on your own computer, you're always in a safer situation than if you do testing that involves some kind of interaction with other computers. Um, and here's why. If I manipulate the client software on my own computer in order to test and see how the server reacts to that manipulation, I'm sending packets from the client to the server. Okay, So just to go back for a second, um, I'm transmitting codes or commands to another computer. And if those codes or commands cause damage, as interpreted under the statute, then I am um, I could be liable under the CFAA. And damage, again, means impairment to the integrity of the data. Um, or if the game soft, so that's one way the CFAA could apply to online gaming. Another way is if the um, terms of service or the EULA for the game says that you're not going to do this and you're not going to make any kind of contact with the game server using software or client software that's been manipulated in any way or that's been reverse engineered in any way, then you do so. Then under the Lori Drew theory, you violated the terms of service, so you are accessing the game server without authorization, and again, that's a potential Computer Fraud and Abuse Act violation. So. Um, this is the problem with doing reverse engineering with code that runs on, you know, with code on your machine that interacts with code on another machine. Okay, how does this, has this been applied to online games? Well, there's one case that I found where the um, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was a claim that was raised in a civil case, and this was Blizzard versus In-Game Dollar. Um, there's, it's no accident that I used World of Warcraft as an example. It's an extremely popular game. In fact, several of my friends have lost many hours of their lives to it. Um, maybe lost is the wrong word, but Blizzard is very, very, very litigious. So um, they do they bring a lot of lawsuits to protect their, their varied interests. And in this case, um, this was a company that was doing gold farming. Um, and do people know what that is? Basically, you, they uh, create, you know, they, it's a bot that creates uh, value, valuable gold pieces within the game. And Blizzard sued them, and one of the claims that they brought was the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And the other claim that they brought was the California Computer Crime Statute, which is uh, Section 502C under the California law. And um, so I looked at the claims for this, and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act claim was very much focused actually on the idea that um, this company advertised its gold farming services through spam to World of Warcraft users. And that there was tons of spam coming through on the network all the time where they were saying, like, use our service, use our service. And people were getting a lot of messages. And it was degrading the network because the network was having to take up time to process and distribute all of these spam messages. Um, so again, when we're thinking about, and that this was the damage, right? So again, when thinking about damage, which is impairment to the integrity or availability of data, doesn't mean you're bringing down the system. 
courts have said even where you know kind of system availability or the speed of traffic is degraded then that can be damaged too and this is what Blizzard said that in-game dollar was doing um, and so okay spam it's not really that much about the interoperability or interaction of the reverse engineered software with the clients or rather with the server software in the game um, but the California computer crime statute claim had no such distinction in it about, well, this is really just about the sending of the spam. In that statute, there are very much seemed like they were saying, you know, just by having this program running and interacting with the, with the server software, that that violates the California computer crime statute, which is a little bit broader than Section 50, than, uh, than Section 1030. Okay, um, and there were, I looked around for some other examples of whether this, this claim has been brought in civil cases, and I haven't seen it, but given the breadth of state computer crime statutes and of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, I think it's worth noting that if you're going to be doing reverse engineering of online games or any other kind of code where you have client software that sits on your machine that interacts with any kind of server or any kind of software that's out there on the network, that you need to start thinking about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and the, the corollary state laws and whether those apply to you. Okay. So this is all sad and dangerous and everybody's thinking, God, the law sucks. What can we do? So here we have some strategies and lessons from these stories about what you can do. So you want to talk about the ones that are relevant to your part or should I just uh, go? I'll sure. go ahead. I, we can show you, can chime, you can chime in. How's this, that? This okay. is on. Okay. Um, so first, um, avoid clicking through EULAs if possible. And again, as Fred said, you know, it doesn't help to not read them, but if you can avoid clicking on them, that's a great way to go. Um, yeah, and the con one, one, one concrete piece of advice on that, um, it's not a guarantee that you'll be able to dodge a EULA, but I have often told people if you're intent on reverse engineering, particularly software that's included with hardware, uh, eBay can be your friend. Right? If you were to buy an uh, iPhone, for example, from eBay that already was activated and had the firmware installed, well, then you haven't clicked I agree to anything. And I think Apple would have a hard time arguing that you're somehow bound by any kind of contract because you didn't agree to a contract. Uh, now, the person who sold you the iPhone, maybe they breached their contract. But hey, that's between Apple and person number one, not between Apple and you. Uh, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, I'm not saying that'll work every time. There have been courts that have said, hey, wait a minute, you knew there was a contract, and so this dodge may or may not work. But all else being equal, eBay can be your friend. Yeah, and also, though, to really distinguish there between going and buying something legitimately on eBay and getting a copy of the software that you know is infringing, okay? Because a lot of the exceptions, as Fred said before, that apply to protect reverse engineers don't apply if you, have a, if you infringe to get the copy of the software that you're reverse engineering in the first place. So legitimate, bona fide, for value purchase, that's good, um, or could be good, can help getting a cracked version or something that you know is infringing. Always bad. Always bad. Causes more problems. Okay. Um, think about what you're doing before you copy, and copy no more than is necessary to do the job. So for individuals, this can be a little bit difficult, but what we tell people and what companies do when they do reverse engineering is they have one set of people who do the reverse engineering and figure out how the code works and derive the, um, the ideas and the functionality from the code. And then those people who've seen the original code take the stuff that they've derived, the information they've derived, and they pass it off to a whole new different set of people that were not allowed to interact with the original piece of code at all. And it's those people that do the programming. This is the, the clean rooming. And this is a way to make sure that you don't inadvertently or accidentally take some of the code and put it in your, um, in your final product. Right. This just happened for anybody who is following the news uh, there's been a bunch of reverse engineering efforts underway in connection with RTMPE, which is a streaming video protocol that is part of some of the latest Flash implementations. And someone thoughtfully out there reverse engineered RTMPE, wrote a piece of code that interoperated with that protocol, and someone else wrote a spec basically looking at that source code, describing exactly how it works pulling out the ideas without pulling any of the code. And so, of course, now if anybody wanted to re-implement, they have a clean spec to do it from. They don't have to click I agree. They don't even have to necessarily have access to the original code at all in order to write a piece of code that can play back RTMPE. 
Uh, which, by the way, if you check, there are some very interesting videos on YouTube that are actually RTMPE, particularly videos that are provided by certain major Hollywood movie studios. So, interesting. Um, okay, if there's encryption or obfuscation or any of these kinds of technical protection measures that were in the list that Fred showed you earlier, um, the slide says reread 1201F, but I would be a little bit more directive about this. If you have that kind of thing as part of something you're reverse engineering, I think you need to talk to a lawyer. Um, the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, you, you know, it is like, it's great for lawyers <laughs> because people need to come and talk to us, and that's wonderful because that's our job. But um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is very complicated, and um, the exemptions to the act are very complicated. And you know, do, what doing something solely for a particular purpose? What does that mean? What does it mean that it's you know for a certain type of interoperability? It, it's it's um, it's subtle and difficult. And so I think that if you're working in an area where you have TPMs, technological protection measures, and that's part of what you're going to be, um, and you're going to be routing around those, then I think it's a great idea to go and talk to a lawyer first. Yeah, and I would say the more effort somebody has put into stopping you from doing it, uh, the more you should talk to a lawyer before you go and jump those hurdles. They're there for a reason. Courts often are sympathetic. Uh, and so you want to be careful. Um, for any who followed this story, there was a guy who made a piece of code called Glider that allowed you to play World of Warcraft on autopilot while you were asleep. So you could level um, up. So you could level up without the trouble and, and bother. Sleep. Uh, and sleep at the same time. <laughs> totally great idea. Awesome. <laughs> uh, sold uh, tens of thousands of copies uh, and got sued by Blizzard. Um, World of Warcraft, for those who don't know, if you're running World of Warcraft on your computer, you're also running a set of code known as Warden, which is Blizzard's code that watches everything else that's executing on your machine while World of Warcraft is executing. And if they spot anything they don't like running in your uh, environment at the same time, they cut off your access to the World of Warcraft servers. And one of the claims that was brought against the guy who designed Glider was the argument that by continuing, by hiding from Warden, by having his Glider code basically elude Warden's uh, surveillance of his own CPU, uh, he was circumventing a technological protection measure, continuing to get access to the server that he wasn't supposed to otherwise access. Uh, and he lost that case. Uh, that'll be appealed. Uh, it's a case we're watching very closely. Uh, but it's an example of how if Warden, if there's a technical measure like Warden that really is designed to stop you from doing what you want to do, that's a good time to call a lawyer before you go and uh, dodge that one. And while Fred's absolutely right that um, you know the more trouble and effort that the um, copyright owner has gone into to put a, some kind of regulation or, or a TPM on that code, it's not true that it requires that that um, technological protection measure be like super good or powerful or strong. Um, it just has to, the statute says it effectively controls access to a copyrighted work. And despite what that might sound like to the average reader, effectively doesn't mean that it's effective. Effectively means that in effect, that's what I was trying to do, as opposed to like I actually effectively accomplished it. So um, the strength of the TPM is not necessarily a trigger for whether the DMCA applies or not. But the in terms of but but he's absolutely right in terms of how difficult how much the copyright owner tried is going to matter in terms of how likely it is that a court will look askance at your circumvention of that measure. Okay, offshoring and its limitations. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I often talk to people who say, oh, there's no problem. We'll just do all of this in another country that doesn't have a DMCA and doesn't care about copyright. Um, that, again, is something you should do very carefully. Uh, some may remember Real Networks is being sued in uh, San Francisco right now for their Real DVD product that allows you to uh, copy your DVDs onto a hard drive uh, for later playback. Um, one of the things that was a big deal in that trial was Real Networks hired a reverse engineering firm in the Ukraine uh, to do the work. Uh, and the motion picture studios just went hammer and tongs about the fact that we all know what goes on in the Ukraine is all a bunch of hacking that can't possibly be okay. Um, so keep in mind the fact that if you're going to go offshore, that doesn't necessarily automatically solve your problem. 
Um, that being said, I've always thought someone could make a great business holding uh, a DEF CON-like conference on a cruise ship in international waters. <laughs> that would be fun. Okay, test on your own machines. I talked about this before, but you know, with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, we're talking about unauthorized access to other people's computers that cause damage to their computers. Um, in the old days, it was really, really hard to do any kind of testing on your own machines because computers were a lot more expensive. Um, they're still expensive, but it's more possible now, I think, to do testing on machines that you control. And if you can do that, um, it obviates a lot of problems that maybe are unnecessary under state and federal laws. Of course, with Blizzard, you don't have access, or, some, or World of Warcraft or something like that, you don't have access to the code that runs on the server, so you're really just being able to study the code that's on your own machine, and then whatever you might try, decide to test or implement you know, you're, you're taking the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act risk. So right. this, is a, this is a, you know, if it's if at all possible, and I understand the limitations, but I do think it's also possible in more circumstances than it used to be. Yeah, and I'll just say, concrete example, if you're going to try to reverse engineer the Flash protocol, better to find somebody who actually has a licensed Flash server, get their permission to use it as a test platform, rather than just hammering on YouTube servers and figuring, oh, what could possibly go wrong? Exactly. These ter- these, there are other people's servers turn out to be inordinately delicate, and you never know. Okay, and the importance of atmospherics. So this is something that, um, again, I'm going to talk about at 1 o'clock a little bit more. But, you know, I can't, it, it, unfortunately, this isn't really how it ought to be, but this is an extremely important thing for judges. Because one of the things you have to understand about courts is that they don't really know all that much about technology, and they don't really know all that much about computer security. Um, and so they're kind of going with their gut on a lot of things. This is true with everything, but I think, you know, it's true with crimes and search warrants and all of that stuff as well. But I think it's particularly true with something where they just don't have like a basic familiarity with it. So um, it, so it's sort of like this, this sensibility about it is something that really makes a difference. So in the Blizzard, in line, in, um, the Blizzard uh, uh, case, basically, you know, one of the things there, people were kind of disgusted by the spam and by the fact that it was cheating. And the idea that this cheating, this gold farming, was not only messing with Blizzard, but was undermining the, um, the experience of all of Blizzard's customers who were just these people who wanted to play their game and had paid their money and that sort of thing. Similarly, with the WoW Glider case that Fred was talking about, this is another thing where it has like the kind of the stink of cheating about it. And if there's courts understand cheating, they may not understand reverse engineering or circumvention or you know, all of that stuff, but they understand the idea that you know, somebody's taking unfair advantage, and that is like unpalatable and we see always you know when we have our cases you have kind of the dry law you know and there's just like what the law says but then there's you know the sort of the advocacy or the art that goes into it and a lot of that has to do with giving people a feeling that you're the one who's supposed to win right and and we so we see that in our in you know just to give you an example of our jailbreaking exemption that we have up before the copyright office now you know our view is, is that it's your phone and you should be able to do what you want with your phone that this is a consumer right and that the phone is kind of locked down and you want to free your phone so that you can run the code that you want to on it and that's that's what we think. Well, when we see what Apple writes back to the copyright office about, you know, this idea in their mind, you know, it's these rogue devices that are, you know, per- posing a danger to their network. There's no real reason to unlock them. It allows you to m- manipulate all sorts of variables on the phone like the unique serial identifier, and the only people who would want to manipulate those identifiers are drug dealers. So, you know, here we've gone from like consumer advocates being like, you know, your phone is yours to do with what you want because you bought it to we're helping drug dealers make their phones untraceable. The, the drug dealers who want to sign up for a two-year AT&T contract to get an iPhone. Yeah. That's, <laughs> those drug dealers. Well, <laughs> you know who you are. So uh, <laughs> You should have talked to me before you did that. So... Um, so, so again, the important of atmospherics and this idea, you know, this idea that so, okay, um, so that's something you know you you've got to think about, and I think a lot of times, you know, and this is something that we have a little bit of 
you know, that courts have a little bit of trouble with at DEF CON, um, you know, this is, you have legitimate research, legitimate reporting by legitimate people in a fun context where people call themselves hackers, and sometimes courts just think a little bit askance at that. I had a case a couple of years ago where um, one of the pieces of evidence that the prosecutor used to show that my client had malicious intent when he did what he did was that when he was arrested, he was wearing a DEF CON T-shirt. So my plan was to show up in the Ninth Circuit. And the case was up in the Ninth Circuit, which is the a, a federal appellate court for Nevada and California and a whole bunch of states in this area. And my plan was to show up in the Ninth Circuit in my DEF CON T-shirt and be like, you know, do I have malicious? And, and my pink suit. And I was going to be like, do I have malicious intent? No, you know, it's okay to wear the shirt. It's not really evidence. But um, then the government decided that I was right and they were wrong and they dismissed the charges. So, you, you know, another thing is you have to be, Thank you. You have to be cognizant of these things, even though sometimes it takes a little bit of the fun out of it. Cool. Anything else? That's it. Okay. Um, so we are going to take questions in room 104. And so we'll go over there, and we're going to be there for about half an hour. And if you guys have other questions, you're welcome to contact us. Um, I'm Jennifer at EFF.org. Fred's Fred at EFF.org. And come and talk to us or email us. And if we can help you, we will. Thank you.